I'll hit record. Is that right? Welcome to today's uh, conversation with Brooke Bircher Gustafson. She runs Bircher Development. Um, my name is Ed Hart. I'm the host of the From the Heart podcast presented by the First Bank Center for Family Owned Businesses. This will be episode number 93 of the From the Heart podcast. And what I love about my job is I get to interview people. Oftentimes I interview people I know really well, and it's fun because it's just, you know, two old friends having a cup, a cup of coffee and a conversation. Other And then there are times when I get to have my first conversation with someone right here on camera, which is what we're going to be doing today. Although Brooke and I were talking off camera, well, on camera, but before we hit record, at least on my end, because of the research that I've done and what I've heard about you and read about you. And I saw you when you guys won you know, Orange County Family Business of the Year and so forth. So I've been aware of you and your business for quite some time. And so it's a treat for me to get to bring um, you to my audience and also to uh, just to meet you. So a little bit about Brooke. She's fifth generation and correct me where I'm off on any of this because I will, I will. I'm reading from either LinkedIn bio or bio that, <laughs> that your team sent to me. Um, so you, your company's five generations old and you're, are you the fifth Bircher to be the leader yes. of the company? Yes, fifth generation. So I, I currently work with my dad, uh, Brandon, fourth generation, and my great great grandfather started the business in 1939. Wow, that's awesome! It's uh, so many things to, to unpack in this conversation. Just the fact that the company has lasted through into the fifth generation, as you know better than anybody doing it, that's very rare. And our audience is mostly made up of a lot, a lot of people, but a lot of family business owners as well, who always want to learn from from other families. Um, so you started at the firm. I'm I'm sort of reading from the bio here, but my understanding is that you started back in 2007. Uh, a lot of experience in the, in the industrial real estate industry, I guess, and an industry I don't know a whole lot about. I, mean, I like to think I know a thing or two about the commercial and and residential, but we'll dive more into into your background. Um, You've been the recipient of the Next Generation Award, which recognizes young leaders in the commercial real estate industry who are likely to become influential for years to come. That was in 2017, so now hard to believe, seven years ago. Yeah. So you went from seven years ago and likely to be influential to now pretty influential. So I guess they got that right. And oh, saying that you, you. you might be yeah. um, like Always your host. We'll see. There yeah. you go. Like, like your host today, she went to USC, uh, undergrad at USC, an MBA from UC Irvine. You're an Orange County girl, I understand. Yes, so, correct. Yeah, born and raised here, uh, actually in uh, Southern California at uh, San Juan Capistrano. So it's nice. uh, been a great, you know, upbringing, and uh, really, yeah, feel feel fortunate to have uh, been been raised here. What's exciting for me is that. Um, you being such a prominent leader in a prominent family business that we're just meeting today for the first time. Just when I thought I knew everybody, I'm humbled and find out that I didn't. So this is pretty cool. Yeah. So, yeah. No, it's great. Well, thank you for the opportunity, Ed. It's, it's yeah, it's you bet. Brooke. I've been part excited. It's such a great and reputable podcast here. Well, thank you. It's been uh, it, it's a, it's a labor of love for sure. So, mm -hmm. so let me just start with a question. When I say family business, take that anywhere you'd like to go with it. Yeah, yeah. Well, look, I think uh, I'll, say, I'll call, first use the word a blessing. I mean, I think, awesome. as you said, not many people have the opportunity to work with family, let alone, you know, really get along with family while they're also working together. So I think the dynamic that I've been blessed to have with my dad has been, I think, certainly unique. He and I are I'll say a great duo. We we certainly complement each other in our kind of approach and work style and um, been able to really learn a lot from him. And he's been an incredible mentor of mine. So I think um, blessed is probably the, the first word I'd say, you know, complicated in the way that it's just, you know, you're working with family and uh, just the dynamics of, you know, for me personally, it's working with dad and for him, I know working with daughter. So um, you know, trying our best to not let work invade into our personal life um, too much. But obviously there's times when deals are getting done during the Christmas or Thanksgiving holiday, and you got to step away for a couple hours when the family's <laughs> together to just get a deal done or negotiate documents or something along those lines. So um, it's been an amazing experience and I feel really blessed to be a part of the family business. I think my dad has always said it best where we kind of stand on the shoulders of the prior generation. And I think the foundation that 
my great grandparents um, and grandparents have left and even just, uh, you know, uncles and cousins and um, great uncles that have all been involved. I mean, they've also helped set an incredible precedent that I've been able to just uh, be a part of, I'll say kind of dovetailing off of, and um, I'm just grateful for the, you know, the value system they held, the reputation they maintained, just all the things that I'll say I've been truly a benefactor of and been able to, you know, just, just learn from, which has been really cool. I love that. What are some of the significant differences between you and your dad that make you lead the organization better? Like, for example, I, I'm a very relationship oriented person. It's all about the yeah. people. One of my closest friends and a previous guest on the podcast, mm -hmm. Bruce Himes, who runs a company down in Chino, California, mm -hmm. he's extremely disciplined. Mm -hmm. um, most people would look at the two of us and think, how are they friends? Because we're so different, but we're actually best of friends. We've never yeah. run a company together because I'd probably, he'd probably drive me crazy because he's so disciplined. And I'd definitely drive him crazy because I'm taking the two hour lunches to go bond with people. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> but somehow we would probably very be very effective in running a company because we're so different. So with that sure. being said, the differences between you and your dad, how how do you use the first of all, what are the significant that you want to share anyway, differences yeah. in your styles and how does that run the company successfully? Yeah. So I, I would first say um, just his ability. To, I mean, he's seen many cycles, right? He's been in the business yeah. for, gosh, it's almost been 50 plus years now. So that experience, I say alongside mine, as I continue to learn in the industry, uh, he's just seen a lot, been through a lot. Mm -hmm. And the wisdom that's there, I think is just uh, a significant asset to how we can uh, kind of dynamically engage each new challenge that that uh, comes across our table. But I think with that, he's able to lend some some really great uh, ways of either kind of experience of how he's navigated through it or wisdom to it. But I think in parallel, I've been able to take that and then implement from, I'll say, a operational or a more tactical approach of kind of how we, okay, this has happened or you've had this experience. Now, how do we implement that real time into the business? Or um, maybe my experience has also been different and uh, kind of altering the viewpoint in ways that maybe he hasn't, you know, has kind of had a, I'll say, a a biased opinion because of something that might have occurred in the past versus kind of the reality of today. So I think there's a good balance between uh, navigating the wisdom of the past and new opportunities that are are um, in front of us today via you know innovation and um, I'll say staying nimble through just the smaller business that we are. But I think the two of us have been able to work together collaboratively and effectively in in um, kind of balancing the, the, that approach. That's good. How do you as a, and I hate to be so obvious in a couple of my questions, you know, a woman in a predominantly male driven industry, and we can go there if you yeah. want or not, but on that a little bit, but not really, if you were male, I'd be asking the same question just slightly differently. How do you find your voice in the company when it's been led by previous four generations in the family you know, you've got this tremendous heritage, a lot of success before you were probably born in the company, obviously. Yeah. Uh, people working there, there's probably a lot of people working there that saw you from age zero to where you are today. How do you find your voice as a leader in an organization, especially since your dad's still there? I mean, one thing, if your dad had yeah. retired and you're in the corner suite and it's you, but you still have him there, but how do you find your voice and, and put your stamp on the business? Yeah. So I think a lot of it comes from uh, external opportunities where I've been able to engage in other organizations, um, you know, serve in different ways through just my own passions. And, um, you know, I, I listen to a lot of you know books. Also, it used to be on tape, but I guess now yeah, it's right. audible. Yeah. Um, you know, listen to a lot of books, podcasts, things like that, where I have been able to formulate, I'll say my own opinion, my own voice on the industry in itself, but also just my own leadership style. And I've been able to, um, through organizations like uh, NAOP, uh, NAIOP, the, the SoCal board, I'm currently an executive board member there, but uh, over prior years have been very involved with the young professionals group there, they call it YPG. Mm -hmm. uh, but that was kind of, I'll say, a, a unique 
uh, kind of training ground for me to kind of find my own self as a leader uh, in the industry, but also just in an organization like that, where you kind of are in a, I'll say a safe place where you're amongst peers, but you can also kind of test the limits of how you want to, you know, voice your opinion or how you want to lead a meeting or how you want to, um, you know, dive into uh, or to kind of challenge thought, right? Maybe just something that might be a little bit more um, status quo, kind of have the, the platform where you can uh, kind of train yourself and, and, and kind of go outside of your comfort zone in that way. So for me, how I've been able to bring kind of those external opportunities into the business has been, I think, a really unique opportunity and um, something I'd encourage, you know, listeners to do or you're the younger generation to do is keep kind of exploring things that you're passionate about or areas where you could um, continue to learn like a public speaking class or yeah. something along those lines where or even to like a strategy class where you could bring that into your business that may not be specifically related to your core focus, but you can take elements of it and really um, accelerate kind of who who you are. And like you said, your voice and in, inside the business. Did you have a policy in the family of you have to go get a degree, you have an undergrad and a graduate degree, as we talked about in the intro, you've worked outside the business. Were those because it was required or you would have done it anyway? What's the policy as far as getting outside yeah. uh, experience and education before coming in? Yeah, you know, there wasn't really, I'll say, a kind of a policy with the family of what was required or not to join. It was more just, hey, if you're interested and passionate about it, would love. It's, it was always an open door. Yeah. Uh, for me personally, I always kind of had, I had my own goals of wanting to graduate with an undergraduate degree, um, continue to stay engaged in other organizations. I just, I'm a, a somewhat of a, I'll say a yes person, but maybe a, a busy body in that way where I feel just, I get uh, excited by the fact that, that you can continually learn things about yourself and discover things about different industries or, you know, places through those types of experiences. So my extended education at, at UCI, getting my MBA, that was really driven by just a, a desire to go and get it, but also um, knowing that this industry really at the core is all about finance um, and understanding the fundamentals of finance. Yeah. That was really a big catalyst too for me to, to get my MBA and spend the time doing that um, so that I could feel like I had a, a pretty good foundation outside of just what I learned. Um, I'll say school of hard knocks through, uh, yeah. through the business side. Was there a moment when you realized this is what you wanted to do, or was it a, just always growing up thinking I'm probably going to do it or I'm never yeah. going to do it. And then suddenly the light bulb went off. How did that process work for you? Yeah. So for me, it was again, always kind of, I'll say bred into the family uh, inadvertently by way of just cousins, uncles, grandparents, my dad, all involved in the business. So definitely heard about the business through holidays, get togethers over the dinner table. Um, but I, you know, I actually went through my undergraduate degree, not knowing that I was going to join the family business after I graduated. It was really more of, I'll say kind of a discovery of what I wanted to do through college. Um, actually I was, uh, anticipating more of a, uh, uh, public relations, kind of marketing, um, that uh, approach uh, when I was going through college, did several internships in LA and New York, thinking that was the direction I wanted to go. But thankfully, I tried those out and realized it wasn't really for me. So um, at the time I had graduated, I, I had the door open to join the family business and I thought I'd give it a try. Of course, I had to start at the very, I'll say lowest tier, just starting in market research and right. understanding leasing and dynamics of the market and then kind of growing my way um, through that, but, you know, leasing property management, asset management, then development, entitlement, um, underwriting, and, uh, and then, you know, soon starting the business back up with dad in 2016. Right. What would you say has been the biggest surprise, something that you just did not expect? And now it's either something you're good at that you didn't think you would be, or maybe you yeah. struggle with that you didn't think you would, or about the industry. Is there anything that just almost like shocked you when you came yeah. in and started moving along into the company? Yeah. And, you know, I think really just loving every aspect of it, you know, so I'm actually a, a full-time working mom. So I have three little mm -hmm. kids at home. Um, yeah. I know sometimes, oftentimes the, the natural progression is for women to step out of the, you know, the business world once they start a family or start having kids, just there's other priorities, you know, that take precedent or at least, you know, hit pause for a while. But for me, I think I just, uh, 
the passion that I have for the real estate industry and just every aspect of it, I'll say is continues to surprise me because I just, I really do wake up every day loving what I do. Um, even when there's challenges uh, through the days, weeks, um, it, it just, it's, I like working through that, the strategy mm-hmm. side of it, um, really collaborating with my team, you know, being with wonderful people and, you um, for me to an opportunity to use the business as a platform for a higher purpose. Um, I'm not solely focused on, you know, it's nice to, to uh, work for, you know, the monetary aspect, but really for me, I see it as a platform where I can use it as a point of reference for ministry and sharing more about my passion and my faith. Um, but also just uh, also giving, you know, and, and blessing others in our community as we continue to grow our firm as well. Yeah, I love that. I love that you've used the word blessing a lot. And, um, you know, I've had pastors on this podcast. I've had a lot of business leaders. Faith comes up quite a bit. Uh, Mm -hmm. I'm a man of faith as well. And so maybe that's one of the reasons why I like to bring it up. But in your bio, it's it's clear to me that you have a strong faith. And just from your words now, how has your faith, a couple of ways I can go. There's a fork in the road here. I can go one direction or another on this question. So I'll, I'll, I'll choose one fork and maybe come back to the other. How has your faith driven you as a leader, especially where you are now? Yeah. So I'd say my faith has never been more challenged than when I have been a leader. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think mm-hmm. for me, um, in a in a good way, uh, yeah. you know, having kids, starting a family, those have its own challenges. But I think being a leader is very is a very different dynamic because you have all people from all walks of life all, you know, angles of where the macroeconomic dynamics can uh, be an influence into your success or not, Um, you know, partners, uh, again, yeah, people, projects, all the, all just the uh, variables that come into play in the business world um, that are somewhat out of your control that, you know, when you're parenting, you can tell your kid, no, sometimes they'll listen, sometimes they won't, but at least you're still in control in a way. So I think for me, where faith has really played out to just the better and and has actually, my faith has become stronger, has been in the last five, six years where we have kind of started our business from ground zero. Um, No people, no projects, no partners, kind of a clean slate for dad and I. And um, I've just seen God work in amazing ways. And I think kind of to the bottom line of it is just how um, I felt more provided for when, you know, there's been times where there's been, you know, more stress, more, you know, anxiety, more unknowns, but it's like, I just get this continual um, sense of peace and uh, just provision and being provided for in ways that I just couldn't attribute other than my faith in God working in what I'm doing, which has been a wonderful validation that he has me here at this Mm -hmm. time, you know, for a purpose. And it's, it's just cool to know that, um, you know, daily, I pray that his will be done and I, I see it happening. So it's, yeah. it's really, it's cool to witness it. Yeah. I love when you realize that he's not only working in the business, he's working on the business and he's working on you Yeah, and working as a leader, because you have like a lot of us, you have, you know, your faith. If you look mm-hmm. at the pyramid and this is how most of us who are believers would look at it is we have our faith then you're a spouse and you're a mother yeah. Then you're a community member and a, a Christian and the and the giving and the ways that you serve within your faith. And oh yeah, yeah by the way, you're the CEO of this company. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I heard somebody just yesterday, I hosted a family business panel at an event yesterday and I had um, Ed Lee from Wahoo's, Charles Antis of Antis Roofing, uh-huh. uh, Michael Gavinia of Gavinia Gourmet Coffee and Andreas Havagius of Farmer Boys on this panel. And we talked about work-life balance and they're all dad. Well, Michael just recently got married, but everybody else has younger kids. And in two cases, two of the four men there have twins, young twins, and trying to balance all of that plus their faith and everything else. And Andreas made an interesting comment that I never really thought about. And because we all talk about work-life balance and that's kind of where I was going to take this question. But, you know, he said, you know, as, as an executive and an owner and a leader in a company, you really aren't balanced. I mean, he goes, but the nice thing is with my dad, there were times when my dad wasn't there like a hundred percent of the time, but then when he was with us, he was a hundred percent with us. And I thought that was a really kind of a cool way to put it. It's like, you know, when I'm home with my kids, I'm home with my kids. Mm -hmm. So with those, that pyramid I just described and all those different roles that you have and a lot of other roles that I didn't even think about to mention, how do you, I'll use the word balance, even though it's probably the wrong word. How do you, how do you, how do you do it? 
Yeah. <laughs> I guess that's the question. Well, that's How do we do it? Yeah. Didn't mean to no, stress you, you out, Brooke, but exactly. You no, look, I think, well, well, again, going back to faith, like a lot of prayer, right. Of just kind of God creating the time and the space and every single day where I can be, you know, focused and committed in all the areas I feel drawn to, or that I'm committed to. But I definitely think too, just a the ability to delegate is very important. Uh, the ability to, I think, I'll say choose the right spouse. You know, I, I think my husband has been a wonderful um, uh, support system, knowing kind of my passions for work and that we also wanted to have a family. So that's, you know, a big undertaking for him too. Um, and I think, yeah, just your your peer group and, and network of just being intentional with the people you spend your time with and how you spend your time. And I think, you do have to be uh, strategic about your daily, I'll call it um, critical paths, right? Like you, you've yeah. got to, you kind of have to calculate every minute yeah. of every day. I hate to say it's accounted for, but otherwise it just would be chaos, right? So uh, it's a little bit more controlled chaos, I'll say in, yeah. in that sense. So. so with all of that and you do something for you, what do you do? What I mean, this isn't yeah. the, what are your hobbies, but in a sure, way. Sure, no, that's a good you, question. How do you, how do you, find, how do you find the brook time and what do you do with it? Yeah. Yeah. So like you said, I mean, kind of to the example of being present when you're home, I mean, that for me is just number one. I love being with my family. So really kind of the, the focus time, but for me personally, um, it, I love creative writing actually. So yeah, I found awesome. a really unique outlet, uh, over the last few years that I've tapped into. I've always loved like the arts and, uh, reading, writing, you know, art, art painting in itself. Um, but creative writing has been fun. So actually on my drives to and from work, that's kind of my only quiet time and me time. I've been listening to some uh, audible books about how to write, you know, a, a, a novel or how to write a script and just kind of nice. piecing that together and then actually doing it. And um, it's really been fun. It's really that's cool. cool outlet. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I, I, I wrote and published a, a fiction book in 2004. Good for you. I, I wrote and it never got published, but I finished it and wrote a um, a biography of a former major league baseball scout. I come from a baseball background Very and cool. I've, I probably have 11 or 12 different book folders that I'm staring at on my big screen on my, on my laptop right now of yeah. books that I, and ideas I've started, but I'm actually working on one now that's going to come out this year. And it's um, I'm a, I'm turning 60 in April. And okay. so I'm the last year of the baby boomer generation. Yeah. And so we're calling the book Boomer Wisdom Lessons for the Next Generation. And oh, that'll be a great one. Since oh I'm turning God, 60. I'm sure you could draw on a lot of people for that. Yeah. And what actually I've done is I've enrolled 59 other people to write it with me. So there's oh, that's 60 cool. chapters. Yeah. I'm turning well, 60. I look forward to reading that. As, as yeah. long as it's not audible, I'll make the time. There you go. And, and <laughs> uh, you know, as, you maybe know, I can talk to your dad whatever. about joining us on that. You're a long yeah. ways away from being in that category, but you know, I'd love to talk with your dad. I'd love to. I'm. I am trying to get a lot of business owners, especially family businesses to contribute. Mm -hmm. I mean, Ken Blanchard, who was one of my mentors, wrote the one minute manager and mm -hmm. servant leadership in action. He's contributing and Gary Ridge of WD 40. And there's a lot of, a lot of yeah. somewhat household names that are contributing, but you know, I'm also very interested in getting just those family business leaders who have worked with, you know, for generations in their business. So yeah, if, if you think that your dad would be interested in that, maybe that's a great way for me to meet him. Yeah, well, I'll have to ask him. That'd be yeah. great. It sounds like we'll have more to talk about post podcast here. I hope so. I, I hope creative so. writing. Maybe you can give mm -hmm. me some nuggets. So there you go. I love to write. I don't know that I'm I'm your mentor or, or an example of that, <laughs> but I just love to write. Yeah. So tell us about Bircher. Tell us about the company. Promote the company a little bit. I mean, what's yeah. your ideal, you know, client and where geographically and and uh, just you know a little bit more about those that may not know anything about you. Yeah, so we're celebrating 85 years this year. Uh, again, five generation family development firm. We're focused primarily on industrial real estate investment and development. Um, most recently in the last, uh, I'll say five to six years have been focused here in Southern California on entitlement opportunities. You know, it's a really unique place to um, spend our time. And that's really where our expertise is, is navigating uh, the jurisdictional approvals um, and, and getting a larger scale projects through to uh, completion on the entitlement side so that we can then also build uh, these projects through the vertical development, you know, construction, and then see it all the way through to leasing and long-term asset and property management. So we're kind of a, I'll say a fully integrated shop in that way, although we do outsource our financing, um, you know, equity opportunities, joint ventures, 
um, and even uh, raising funds through outside, you know, third party capital. Um, but we do manage all of that in house too. So it's a really unique opportunity. We really like to stay, I'll say, focused in uh, Southern California for now. Over the years, I mean, in our 85 years, we've done, uh, I'll say, it all. Right? We've been, we've had an exceptional team with targeted expertise that we've hired, and and Brandy and I have had a experience in, but across all asset classes. Um, and again, nationally. So most recently kind of came off of a partnership with a, a publicly traded REIT that didn't have a platform in New North America yet. So we established their North American platform and put about 3 billion of equity to work with them and um, offices on uh, East Coast, West Coast. So uh, we've kind of, I think the, the exciting thing about Bercher is that Although we are, I'll say, smaller uh, in nature and family business by nature, we really are institutional in how we operate and also very nimble. Um, and I think the fact that, you know, we have 85 years, although longevity is nice, uh, yeah. it's 85 years of, you know, solving problems, successful projects, um, which I think continues to keep us relevant in each cycle and has been a really unique way that we've been able to shift and shape ourselves uh, in more dynamically as the, the market and investment opportunities change. If it's possible to nail down a couple of things that have made the company last 85 years, what would what comes to mind for you? Yeah, um, let's say first, I think integrity. I mean, I think your relationships, value system, um, and kind of how you interact with your peers, your, you know, your lenders, your partners, just all, all at brokers, um, customers, it's just that that's something that can't be bought, right? And uh, can be lost very quickly too. So I think for us, that's I think, twenty years to burn a bridge and two seconds to blow it up. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. So for us, that's that's really at the core. I think of our value system is the relationships and integrity that we have in doing what we say we'll do. Um, but I think you know innovation is another one. Uh, that we've been able to, it's its amazing, even though over the years we've kind of expanded and contracted, Bercher used to have a construction company in the 80s at one point with hundreds of employees. Um, we've even been down to, you know, five employees at one time. So, I mean, the, the ability for us, even as we've grown, to stay nimble, to stay innovative, stay ahead of the market trends, um, be at the forefront of that and react quickly to change has been, I think, a, a real a big reason why uh, we've been successful. We haven't, you know, each generation hasn't gotten, I'll say, stuck in their ways. Yeah. They've been open to new opportunities, um, new markets, new, you know, pivoting to new asset classes, new partners, just to continue to, to stay relevant. So I think that's been a, a huge attribute as to why we've, we've been now Gen 5. Are there big the, the BHAGs from the NBA times, right? The big yeah. the audacious goals. Are there big um, visions that you personally have that you would like to see the company? Because you talked about what they've been and what they're not now. So certainly at some yeah. point down the road, there might be new things. Anything in particular come to mind that's out there for you on the horizon that you'd like to see the company do? I mean, we all want to do things differently or better and improve the culture and add more companies or maybe more product lines or whatever. But yeah. anything jump out at you that you're hoping to be your stamp on it when you pass it on to one of your three kids or whatever the next yeah. gen is. Yeah. So I think for us or for, for me really been uh, focused on our asset management. So I know in generations prior, that has been something where we've been more of a merchant build model or short-term, you know, asset manager. So certainly have the skill set and the expertise to do that, which is currently what we've been ramping up to do. Um, but it does take time, you know, to build mm -hmm. AUM. So for us, it's really, focused on scale. I'm, I'm focused on the opportunities where we can retain asset management for the long term um, and just how long it takes us to, you know, entitle, build, you know, dream up, design, build and implement and lease these projects. I mean, they're multi-year, you know, four or five years, you're finally stabilized for some of these hundred acre master planned opportunities that we invest in and to just kind of sell that off on, on year six, because the IRR is telling you to do it. Um, I know that's been something that we're trying to now pivot away from. So that's, that's a, I'll say a change that I'm excited to plant my flag in for gen five of just a sure. differentiator from prior, uh, prior gens. And then, um, you know, we have some exciting new projects that we're also working on that are a little bit outside of our core, 
um, but have been really unique opportunities where, again, we can stay. I think it'll keep us uh, very relevant in as times just continue to change. And it's a different, you know, uh, market than when my dad and my grandfather, you know, first entered into the business at kind of their timeline and their their career where I'm at. Um, you know, there were less less publicly traded companies and in, in the industrial space, there were, um, you know, l less pro product available, or um, I'll say just even just by way of com competitors in the market, m more land availability, you know, so just yeah. the dynamics of how we have to think through each new deal has certainly changed. Regulations are getting more stringent in California. So, you know, looking at markets outside of California, um, is certainly where, where we're headed. So I think for us, it's really, for me, uh, it's really uh, focused on um, kind of staying, I'll say, relevant as yeah. the financial markets have changed. Competition has become much more, um, just made it more challenging to get deals done yeah. and uh, certainly need to stay dy dynamic in that way. Yeah, 30 years ago, if I saw some property come available, I'd make a phone call and within a couple of days, they're calling me back and we're having conversations and it's like, yeah. you know, hey, let's have a cup of coffee and all of that. Mm -hmm. Now, if a sign goes up, you better call now because someone else is buying that by the end of the day. Yeah. You know, the competition yeah. to get that land, the competition to 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 build and everything else. I, I mean, I'm not in your space, but I've seen it enough just from the outside looking in and making phone calls at land that became available and just, you know, I, I yeah. dragged my feet for three days and the for sale sign's gone. It's like, well, yeah. they took it down. No, they didn't take it down. They sold it. So, yeah. So what do you love? Well, and I think a lot of it too, you know, having a, a deep bench, I'll say here where we've really hired a, a, an incredible team that, like I said, is, um, has the experience in each kind of component of the business of what we focus on entitlement, asset management, development, um, but just even as a, le a business leader, you know, having that exceptional knowledge and expertise in the industry trends that are kind of what's next, right? Because you can't just, uh, more often than not, I'll say kind of 80-20, you, you don't want to be behind the trends and um, uh, in certain areas where, you know, innovation is really the only way to kind of stay alive in this game. And I think uh, it's going to be critical that, you know, I, I personally, you yeah. know, stay really deep in, in that uh, market research and uh, understanding of uh, business trends and where that's going. Yeah. So you're driving home from work and you're thinking to yourself, this was my best day. Mm -hmm. What happened to make that such a great day at work? <laughs> oh boy. Um, I got to have lunch. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, Speaking um, of which, it's, it's something in the afternoon on a Friday no, when we're exactly. I haven't had lunch yet. So now you got my no. stomach growling. Look, I think, you know, for me, it's just a scene uh, where I have the most fun and it's a great day is like, you know, when da dad and I sit in a room together with some of our team members and we just, we come up with solutions to problems that have been, you know, nagging on us for weeks or months at a time. And, you know, the collaboration of, like I said, just the, the team here is, um, I think one of my favorite parts about my day. Uh, so I think the, you know, the presence in office and the creativity and the whiteboarding kind of charrettes of, of uh, working through the issues and challenges is because um, there's many in this business and right. it seems like they're coming at all angles right. uh, is I think one of my favorite, favorite parts of the day. So certainly I'd say that. Awesome. I like that. And I liked how when, as you started to answer that, you lit up. <laughs> I mean, you've already been lit up through this whole interview, but yeah, I just yeah. have to smile well, more and because be you're up, thinking in terms being of... honest. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Well, no, yeah. I like that. But I will, been... I, mean, I will say the dynamic that has changed, right, because of COVID with the work from home and mm. that kind of uh, uh, either expectation or preference, leaning preference for a lot of um, people in the workforce, you know, where you just, I, I have, we have days, we offer a work from home Wednesday for the team. And, you know, I think we all realize the importance of it because you get that focused time and you're not on the road. And sometimes yeah. it's nice just to be like in a consistent mind, um, mind frame and not be constantly interrupted with meetings and people tapping you on the shoulder. But I think the dynamic that we get here when everybody's in the office, it's just so different. And you can see why it's so necessary uh, for a business to be successful. Um, you got to have the people there present to keep right. things moving in, I think, a good direction. Yeah, that's interesting. I was going to, that's where I was going to go. I was going to ask what the impact has been on you. And I love the work from home Wednesday. I know a lot of companies 
you know, they give you the option. You can, I mean, I have the option where I work with First Bank. I can go into the office when I need to. I go on the road a bit because we have offices around California that I visit a lot um, up north and down in San Diego and so forth. But I like having that day where number one, Wednesday is kind of cool because everybody knows that two days in the office, then they have that day that they can, yeah. you know, I know some of us think we're more productive if we're working from home and we're quiet and we close the door, but really we're a people business just like you are. And yeah, you know, I always come away. I, my answer to that question that I just asked you, it's a great day. What happened is I've been around a lot of people from work and clients and other family businesses. I've had a chance to do a podcast, talk with great people like you and learn more from people. When you think yeah. about every, all of us have had, and I could name several for myself, but, um, I'm not interviewing me. I'm interviewing you. So I'm going to, <laughs> no nobody, 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 nobody wants to hear my challenges, yeah. but um, can you share with us a big challenge? You don't have to go into any detail that you don't want to go into. Obviously it's completely on you, a big challenge and how you worked your way through it. Who was there to help you? I'm, I'm assuming prayer was a big part of it from what we talked about earlier, but help those that might be going through a pretty big challenge right now. To, to look at the pattern you followed to get through that challenge. Yeah. Yeah. So I think um, the tendency is always to think of the worst case scenario, right? And I think it's, that's good to do, but with parameters around how far you let that go or expand in your, your heart, your mind, your business plan, right? I mean, there's, you have to certainly think through the downside and everything thing, you know, but you can't predict everything either. So it's inevitable that things are always going to go go wrong, or maybe just not as planned. Um, but I think, you know, when you're dealing with those challenges head on, I think it's you got to certainly deal with it head on and know kind of what it is and um, call it what it is. But don't let that kind of drown you in analysis paralysis or the indecision. I mean, you got to also get back up on your feet and start taking action. So I think um, it's it's important to like let it sink in and let it be a bummer or let it be whatever mm -hmm. it is in that challenge in that moment, I'll say emotionally. But when you move it over to kind of the, the leadership and what we do next aspect, it's like I said, you got to kind of get back up on your feet, work with people. You can't do it isolated, right? You got to bring in people that either have the expertise that it can opine, guide, and mentor you through that process to help you see the light at the end of the tunnel, or at least just support you that, you know, there's, there's yeah. going to be a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, but also just create a plan. I think I mentioned earlier, kind of a, a critical path um, plan. That's kind of your 30, 60, 90 day approach to it. Oftentimes decisions need to be, be made even earlier than that. But if it's kind of a long-term workout, I'll call it on a challenge or an issue, um, really kind of setting those milestones. So you don't, so you see that you're moving the needle daily. Um, mm -hmm. and you can look back weeks or months after and say, wow, like, look, look how we got here. And, and it really was done, you know, sequentially the right way, thoughtfully, as opposed to again, analysis paralysis or rushing mm -hmm. to a decision that may not be, the, the best. And I think, again, just reaching out to people who have either been through it um, or just collaborating with people that you trust uh, is absolutely critical. Yeah. I hear the term a lot, fight, flight, or freeze. You know, when a situation yeah. is tough, some people will fight through it. Some people will fly away and many people will just freeze. They just get into that analysis paralysis. It's like, yeah. you know, maybe if I just keep diving deeper and deeper and deeper into the data, the problem will solve itself. And that doesn't always happen. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of people don't want to confront like what the problem is, right? Because sometimes yeah. it has to do with, again, from a, a business perspective, it may be your personnel that may be the issue. It may be the, you know, the financing structure that's the issue. And you got to have a tough conversation with your partner or, you know, just all the things. And, and it's easy to, I think, kind of turn a blind eye when you don't want to have tough conversations or um, deal with it head on, or maybe it's you as a leader, right? Maybe you yeah. kind of messed up or just didn't make the right, make, make the right call and you got to just own up to it. So I think it's, um, it's never easy to be introspective, yeah. but yeah. I think it's, uh, you got to look inward first before you can sure. start taking action outward. I think I could probably answer this just in the 40 minutes I've gotten to know you, you know, it's funny because it feels like it's, I, you know, you're, as you're talking, I'm feeling like I can, I can start to kind of see little themes here. Describe the culture 
at Bircher. What's it like? What's it like yeah. there? If, I, if you're interviewing somebody and you're trying to convince them to come on board, tell us about the company a little bit. Yeah, well, I think I'll, I'll gratefully say it's it's like a family business. I mean, yeah. we we certainly run, like I said, institutionally in the way that we you know report to our partners and underwrite opportunities and assess new deal flow and uh, you know outwardly present ourselves. But I'll say, you know, internally the team we've got you know, the team kind of um, experiences that we go, we go do offsite together. Um, I think it's, it's very much, you know, we like to, to do the lunches or travel together. I mean, there's just a lot of um, that kind of family friend dynamic. Um, I think everybody here is similar um, value system. Again, whether they, they have a faith or not, there's an underlying value system there that I know everybody has highest integrity and treats people with respect and, um, that's a big component of our, our day to day, but I think we have a lot of fun too. You know, we, yeah. we try and make it a fun <laughs> office dynamic and just laugh a lot and make fun of each other. And it's, that's it's good. good. That's important. Yeah. <laughs> you gotta, you gotta not take everything so seriously too. So it's, How many employees do you guys have roughly? Yes. Yeah, so we've got about 12, 12 right now. Yeah. Um, so it's been, you know, we've been growing. It was just dad yeah. and I, uh, in 2016, when we sold our interest in the other firm, it was kind of a, a non-compete period. And like I said, kind of a, a cold start, which is pretty dynamic, actually, I'll say for the, the family business, because it, as many family businesses might know, it's kind of just generation, generation after generation of kind of, a, I'll say, a rinse and repeat model. Um, rarely, I guess, do you see the, an opportunity for full reinvention or full startup uh, mode, I'll say, which dad and I had an opportunity to do where it was just a, a cold start again and really do things the way we wanted to do it and not, I'll say, inherit much of the, the prior gens just makings, right? Um, so it's it's been an interesting thing where we've been, I'll say, in startup mode and it was just the two of us, like I said, so we've grown yeah. to a team of 10 and uh, it's been great. We've been really thoughtful about who we've hired and just wonderful people. What was the gap? You talk, you've talked to a couple of times about how kind of that startup mode from 2016 on, what was the length of time and gap and the purpose for the gap? Yeah, it was more, again, a, a non-compete. So we had, you know, quite a few opportunities at, between us and, and the partner where, you know, Brandy was CEO of the company at the time. And I was uh, one of the d development team, you know, members there. So I think there was just a lot of, um, I think by way of the nature of how the, the, uh, the, firm was structured, just required us to pause for a bit yeah. and, um, you know, not go out and start soliciting new opportunities when we just came off the heels of being fully integrated into very dynamic market on acquisitions and development. So, yeah. um, but it was great because it really gave us an opportunity to just to, to dream up the the best of what we wanted Bircher to be. And um, I think now we're in full execution mode on that, which is cool. really been fun to see it come to fruition. Love it. How old are your kids? So my daughter is six and then I have twin boys that are four. Wow. That's yeah. awesome. Talk yeah. about so twins. talking about challenges, I mean, that was a surprise. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're having twins, but it's like, man, how do we navigate this one? So, right. you know, yeah. that one. And now you're, you're outnumbered it, three or two, just like that. On. Outnumbered yeah, overnight exactly. too. Sure. What exactly. do you hope that as you live your life and they look at you, you know, your boys and your daughter, you know, certainly probably different wishes for your daughter than for the boys just because of the, the gender differences. But yeah. what do you hope they're learning from you as that balanced all the roles we talked about earlier, just lessons that you, cause we, you know, I have four adult kids in their thirties, but we have nine grandsons from ages oh, 12 cool. down to just a couple months. And yeah. I certainly have things that I want them to learn from me and things I want them to learn to not do for me as well. But yeah. when you, when you think about your legacy to them, mm -hmm. what, what do you hope for? Yeah, look, I think, uh, as I've shared with you, my faith is a big part of my life. So I think it's just really just having them fulfill what God has put on their heart to be their passion. I mean, I think there's certainly, I'll say in Southern California, but probably other parts of the world too, but SoCal's what I know, uh, you know, a pressure to be a certain type of uh, person or a certain type of success. And I don't think that's for everybody. Um, and so I think just the the ability to just do what they love and follow that passionately and and find a way to make that the core, core part of their life, um, whether they decide to have a family or not. But I just think um, 
just following that. Cause I, I think you'll always feel a sense of unfulfillment if you don't follow what, you know, God has put you here on earth to do yeah. and you'll always be seeking it, but it'll be in other ways that may not be so good for you or, you know, just may not fulfill you in the ways that you could be. So um, I think that that's probably the, um, yeah, the core. Yeah. The core. Mm -hmm. Talk about philanthropy a little bit. What, what um, specific things or, or what's important to you, what's important to the organization? Yeah. So we actually just in the last two years had the opportunity to officially kick off our what we call Bircher Blessing. So that's really a, an opportunity for Brandy and I. We wanted to make an effort for one, the team internally, but also externally um, people to know really, again, where our heart's at. So it's just, you know, based off of Deuteronomy, uh, verse in Deuteronomy that is focused on giving back to the orphan, the widow, um, and the foreigner. And so what we've done is we've created an opportunity internally to take you know, profits from the firm and have team members, each of the team members pick uh, from kind of one of those aspects here locally or globally where they could give and make a difference. So um, it's been really cool to see where the team's heart yeah. is at and what they're passionate about. And, you know, you, you learn a lot about kind of where people are moved to because of family um, experiences or issues they're currently going through or just what what pu pulls on their heartstrings and kind of leads them into giving in unique ways. So we've we've kind of a variety of organizations that have been given to over the last couple of years. And then just me personally involved in our church, um, but also my uh, two people I greatly respect and love um, and, and their approach to just, again, following their passion is my brother, my older brother and his wife, um, they are actually currently in Ukraine uh, mm -hmm. and they've wow. been just really called to serve there, which I mean, you know, you'd think who, who would go there now? Well, um, but those are the types those of people that are there. called. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I think just, um, you know, what hearing what they're dealing with on just not only the war front, but just the way that they've been helping people, you know, the orphans, the, or, and the people who have been just, um, you know, displaced because of the war. So, uh, that's been a pretty amazing thing to to learn about. And I think something we've been, um, my husband and I have been really passionate about too, and, and just light of them getting more engaged as well. Yeah. A couple of last questions to to respect the time and the, and the schedule that you have after this. For those that are working with a parent or going to be going into business with their parent or for parents who are going to be bringing their children in, what words of wisdom would you have? I know it's different for every family. So you can't just, you know, if there were one yeah. way to do things, I wouldn't have a job. Everybody would yeah. be doing it. And everybody, you know, nobody sure. would need somebody like me to help them out. Yeah. Um, yeah. From your perspective, yeah, think, what would you, what, what advice would you give? I would say, um, you know, my how my dad approached it was he really was, I'll say at an arm's length on the early years of my career, probably the first seven years, really kind of, he had me working under somebody else, um, in areas of the business where I could really grow and train and know that this is what I would want, wanted to do. So I think it began being more uniquely, um, engaged in the company where I wasn't particularly, you know, targeting like a, I want to be the CFO here or, um, you know, yeah. the head of acquisitions at some point. I mean, I, I just would say for family businesses, if there's the ability to allow, um, the, the younger generation to come in and see all aspects of the business and see where they fit best, uh, let them kind of explore and experience it, but not under your thumb, uh, mm -hmm. maybe under other folks. There's, I think, a different appreciation for how they learn, um, how they engage, and and kind of what could come of it. And um, I know for me, that was, and dad, it was a really kind of successful approach. Yeah. Well, this is great. I, I really appreciate the time with you today. I'm excited about not just this hour, but also looking forward to future conversations. And as I mentioned before, we started recording um, the value that you bring that I think where you can add some value to a lot of the families that I work with. And so hopefully some things that they do that you could learn from as well. I mean, I think we're all in a constant learning cycle. Yeah. And I think that's why this, uh, these peer groups that we have are so important because we have a chance to sit down with others that are, as I like to say, walking different miles in different shoes, but similar miles and similar shoes to mine. Mm -hmm. And, um, so if you're ever interested in that, let me know. I'd love to introduce you to some some great people here in Southern California and Orange County that, you know, I'm thinking of people I know that would just be dying to hear this interview because they want to get to know you, but also just hearing your story and 
and what you're doing that's working. So yeah, yeah, no, I would love to. So let's yeah. certainly stay engaged. And I appreciate yeah. the time, Ed. It was really wonderful to meet you too. And yeah, fun to just converse here. Well, I have two questions left for you. First is just how do people get a hold of you if they've heard something today about you or the business or want to learn more about Berkshire? Best way for people to reach you is how. Yeah, well, I think, look, I, I email is good, although sometimes it just be, I know I get distracted and behind on it. So, um, look, I think maybe you and I could connect. We could, find, if they know you, it would love to just get okay. connected that way. Otherwise, you know, LinkedIn is always a good way, yeah. sending a message through LinkedIn. Um, I check that also periodically, but usually email is best, but I, okay. I know I get behind on that. I'll put your contact information if you're okay in the notes on this as well. Yeah, so, yeah. all right. But well, the name of my podcast, sure, yeah, yeah. surefire way. Uh -huh. So the name of the podcast is from the heart, um, partially because my last name is heart, but really, you know, my, my goal in all these conversations is to get to the heart of why people do what they do. And I always end with this question. So Brooke, what's in your heart? Good question. Um, oh gosh, I feel like the first word that comes to mind is just joy. I mean, I again, I think I said this from the beginning. I, I just really, I love what I do, and I feel like it is God's will that I'm working in and part of the family business and blessed to do it. So I just, I feel like I'm full of joy, even with the challenges. It's mm -hmm. uh, just a, a really um, unique experience, and I'm just glad to be a part of it.